The Imaginary Diaries of Mary Wollstonecraft presents a creative exploration of the formative years of a pivotal figure in the history of feminist thought. Inspired by Wollstonecraft's genuine letters, along with influences from her original stories and numerous biographical accounts, this work imagines the diary of Mary Wollstonecraft from 1771, when she was just 12 years old, to 1786 at 27. The diary format allows for a deeply personal and reflective exploration of her journey, highlighting the significant influence of her family and friendships, her impactful relationship with Fanny Blood, and the accumulation of her thoughts in the writing of Thoughts on the Education of Daughters. Every week, a serialized version of Mary's imaginary diary will be released, accompanied by illustrative images. This week, we begin with young Mary relocating from a farm near Walkington to the market town of Beverly. The complete book is available through the links in the description. November 13, 1771. Once more, we've packed our belongings and journeyed anew. This turn, we've left behind our farmstead near Walkington for the bustling town of Beverly. I shall mark down the ages of my siblings to remember the age at this time. Ned is 14, I, Mary Wollstonecraft, I am 12, Henry is 10, Bess is 8, Everina is 6, James is 3, and Charles is 1, having just been born on the farm. On days when the weather showed kindest, we'd make the brief trek from Walkington to Beverly, and now, with a heart brimming with joy, I proclaim this charming town my abode. Forward I look to the more refined society Beverly offers. In Beverly, our humble dwelling faces the Wednesday market, amidst county families residing in grand solitary mansions, and homes both semi-detached and in rows. A brief stroll down Highgate, brought me to the majestic Beverly Minster. Near there, the assembly room buzzes with concerts, gatherings, and dances. Nearby, a society of poets convene, and a circulating library offers its volumes for subscription. Truly, a new chapter begins. April 27, 1772. Half a year went by since we settled in Beverly. Now, at 13, I find myself feeling quite the elder beside my younger siblings. I found myself a pupil at a local day school for girls. The school aimed to shape us not just in knowledge, but in becoming ladies fit for marriage. Our studies encompassed the basics of French, the delicate art of needlework, music, dance, writing, and a touch of botany, and the principles of accounts. May 16th, 1772. And I attended the lecture by the esteemed philosopher John Arden in the assembly. And here I lay my notes, lest I forget what I have learned. On electricity, Professor Arden explained the term by using several bodies, such as spirit of wine, oil of turpentine, and gunpowder, which was set on fire by electric shock. The production of sparks and the attraction and repulsion between charged bodies ruled the evening. The audience filled Beverly's assembly hall, for the talk was free because Dr. Arden was practicing for a lecture series in Bath. The few women in attendance were on the arm of the husband or the brother. None were alone like me. The first experiment was conducted by rubbing a glass cylinder against a leather cushion while Dr. Arden explained how electric fluid was sucked from the earth and gathered on the surface of the glass. Professor Arden gestured toward me. I thought he was going to ask me to leave, but this is what he said instead. You may help my daughter, Jane Arden, today. And that's how I became the assistant of the esteemed Professor Arden. Jane brought out her hand, inviting me to step over the rope, separating the philosopher from his audience. Feel the sparks, Jane whispered, as she guided me into the proper place, her touch causing excitement to travel up my arm. Her elegant demeanor and respectful tone surprised my natural constitution. I, so used to interacting with my family, had little experience with girls of my age. The electric fluid from the glass cylinder was collected by metal spikes and absorbed by a long brass tube. 
Jane guided my hand to where the sparks jumped from the metal spikes, so I felt the thrilling fire and shock on my body. I asked so many questions that the men in the audience became agitated with my presence. Their unkind words and provocations made me purposefully block their view. I perceived a slight smile on Jane's lips and found out later she enjoyed this moment although her father did not. Shame on these men for denying me the right to be inquisitive. Knowledge is mine for the taking and belongs in my ears as well. Their women twitter like ugly starlings and flaunt their fake beauty like symmetrical tulips. I prefer to be the thorny rose injuring those trying to steal my beautiful thoughts. The following experiment used a fulminating board that revealed a hidden word by igniting gunpowder when lit by the electrical serum. The board resembled a wooden door typical to the interior of a house, somewhat tilted for the audience to read the message. I was shocked to read the flaming words, Hail, horrors, hail. What kind of message was this? Why wasn't the audience alarmed? It was later I found out I had misread the message. The words had read, Hallelujah. How real it seemed to me at the time. Hail, horrors, hail, indeed. Hallelujah. My mind distracts me with unrest. The pinnacle of the evening came when one of the sparks from the gunpowder experiment alighted on an older woman's hair and caused her to faint when it sizzled in smoke. Apparently, this older woman was fairly important and made a great deal of noise when she awoke, so much that the night was called a complete success. Now here is more good news I wish to retell. So impressed by my inquisitive nature, the esteemed philosopher has invited me to his home to continue lessons. I'll join his highly cultivated daughter, Jane Arden. I have little time to describe the natural and experimental philosophy lectures for Mama expects her dutiful servant to supervise the children while she manages the cook. I paused for some time admiring the course pamphlet and the contents of the 13 lectures. Young gentlemen and ladies may be taught geography, the elements of astronomy, use of globes and maps. Ladies taught practical knowledge other than the required needlepoint and manners. If Papa ever discovered my desire to expand my mind beyond what is expected of me, I may never be able to leave the house again. July 6th. I found a quiet place to read in the breakfast room, the light from the window ample for reading and the heavy curtains allowing some privacy. Before I opened the book, I was distracted by a scene outside the window, which I should describe now. This window faced the rear of the house, our lovely garden surrounded by a high wooden fence. I had attached a small birdhouse to the nearest tree, a towering elm that provided shade for the yard. I was examining a goldfinch whose beautiful yellow-tipped wings shone in the sun when my brother Ned entered the yard with our two younger brothers, Henry, who was 12, and James, who was only 5. Papa's dog Tanner, a good-natured, floppy-eared hound, followed them into the yard. At first, their play seemed harmless, but Tanner got into Mama's vegetable garden. Too lazy to take the dog by the collar, Ned picked up a large stone and hurled it at him. The rock hit poor Tanner's side with such force that he yelped in pain. This caused Henry to laugh, and he threw a much bigger stone at Tanner, who let out another sizable yelp. I knocked on the window to get their attention and succeeded only in capturing Ned's devious and remorseless eye. Since Ned was now glaring at me, he didn't see Henry pick up a log that Papa's axe had previously split. The firewood had a sharp edge. I tried to divert Ned's attention back to the scene, but he raised his fist at me. Henry hurled the log in the short moment, not at Tanner, but at James. The sharp edge hit my poor baby brother right in the head. James looked startled and for a moment didn't do anything except wobble. 
Henry began to laugh as blood trickled down the poor babe's forehead. That's when James started to wail and Ned turned to see the mess. I would have extracted myself from the comfortable seat to rescue James. However, Ned scooped him up and ran back into the house while scolding Henry. My sympathetic heart lies with James. After the event, I returned to reading Goldsmith's poem, The Deserted Village, somewhat irritated at my brother for influencing Henry. However, I was soon taken away by Goldsmith's beautiful language and the meaning behind the words. How similar Beverly is to the lovely village of Auburn before the wealthy destroyed it. I'm jotting down the stanzas from memory for I don't have the original. Thanks to Ned, the flames reduced to ash. More on that later. Here is what I remember of the poem. Sweet Auburn, loveliest village of the plain where health and plenty cheered the laboring swain, the man of wealth and pride, takes up a space that many poor supplied. Sweet Auburn, parents of the blissful hour, thy glades forlorn confess the tyrant's power. Here's the remainder of the story. I felt somewhat obligated to check on James to ensure he was all right. From my comfortable spot, I heard cries from the parlor and Mama's sharp tone. I felt she had control of the situation. However, the breakfast room door opened and Everina faced me. Mary, Mama wants to see you, Everina said. By her tone, Mama was not happy. I was sure it had something to do with the vignette I had just witnessed outside the window. I found Mama in the parlor, her redness going from her cheeks to her her neck. Clutching at her bosom, James had slowed his tears, although the welt on his forehead was quite large. Ned hovered over the fire, pretending to warm his hands. When he saw me, he chuckled and approached Mama from behind. What do you say to this? Mama's accusatory tone surprised me. What have you done to your brother? Me? I asked. Everina? Mama said. Take your brother up to the nursery, bandage his wound. Yes, Mama, Everina's long lashes lowered in contempt. I can do that, I offered to take James. Mama forced him into Everina's arms. Everina, for her part, looked a bit stricken. She was only eight and had difficulty holding on to the squirming child. Perhaps Mary can help, Everina said. Nonsense, Mother said. She caused the injury. That's right, Mary. Ned told me what happened. You were in the garden with James and you let him drop. Drop out of your arms and then instead of helping him you dashed off to your breakfast room to hide in your spot how dare you leave a helpless child injured and wailing on the ground who knows what would have happened to it if it weren't for my dear ned but mama i tried to plead the tyrant of the house my dearly spoiled brother had accused me of the crime if i had told mama what happened she would never have believed me i glared at ned whose hands rested on mama's shoulders she stroked his fingers as if he were her pet. I thought about pointing out Henry was the culprit, but Mama was Ned blind, and he had already created his fabrication. I thought about leaping across the sofa and tackling him to the ground, but I was no match for him. Ned's enjoyment came from bullying me, and he strived to do it every day. Why did you leave him alone, Mary? Ned asked. You should be ashamed of yourself. Mama, if I hadn't come to the yard when I did, who knows what would have happened? She deserves to be locked in her room for the rest of the afternoon. Afternoon. What have you to do today, Mary? Nothing, I am sure. I have plans this afternoon, I shouted, unable to contain my contempt. Jane is expecting me, and it would be impolite to be late. To do some more learning, Ned Mock. Father frowns on that kind of education. I heard reports of your attendance through my peers. Ned tilted his head and took a few quick steps towards me. You will never be apprenticed to a law firm like me or have any other enlightened career. Why do you bother with such silliness. I still held on to Goldsmith's book of poems. I tried to hide it behind my back, but Ned's raven-like eyes followed my movements. Should I tell Papa you've been reading the wrong books again? Ned asked. Papa doesn't hold poetry in contempt. I showed them the book. I have reasons to elevate my mind. Mama gave me a good constitution. I must do my best to become a rational creature. How am I going to learn reasoning to determine the truth in all things if I don't understand them? Mama lowered her head and 
clicked her teacup on its saucer, Papa would surely take his anger out on both of us. Me for being out of control and Mama for her inability to control me. Ned regarded me with such ferocity that I backed away. I was often bewildered by Ned's hatred. Wasn't it enough to be Mama's favorite? He needed to bully me to show off in front of Mama and push me until I lost my temper. So of course I lost my temper. I'm a Wollstonecraft for goodness sake. I don't recall what exactly Ned said next. My emotions took over. Such is my fate. I walked up to Ned, straightened my shoulders and said, I saw you through the window. You were throwing rocks at the dog, encouraging Henry to do the same thing. I refused to be bullied into... At least that's what I was gonna say. But before I could speak, Ned stormed me. He must have seen the intention on my face. Following, he grabbed my wrist and twisted it before I found my voice. You respect me, impertinent child, Ned said. Child, I'm only two years younger than you. I wriggled out of his grip. I was used to his blows, but I didn't want to appear at Jane's with another mark on my face. Imagine the beauties of Beverly gossiping about my brother. It was hard enough to hear the whisper about Papa and his nightly visits to the pub and the racetrack and the rowdy arguments with almost everyone who had ventured to frown in his direction. You don't make eye contact with a deranged animal. I may have said something else to Ned. I'm sure I did. In fact, I was quite mean. He hailed a tin at my head during this exchange, giving me no chance to duck. The sound of the tin striking my head and bouncing to the table was like a muted church bell. I stumbled backward and let out an unintentional shriek. You enormous oaf, came my response. You call yourself a gentleman? What would your peers think of you preying on an innocent girl? Gossip is a deadly sword. Mama and Ned fired rapid arguments against my notion. Mama was particularly offended that I used the word innocent. The cold trickle of blood ran down my forehead, the gash somewhere in my hair. What did you say? Ned whined. Mama, she called me a fool. I said, oaf, there's a difference, but not much. You are right. You are a fool too. Foolish oaf. Mama didn't know what to do. I was sensitive to my wound and preoccupied with it when Ned lunged at me again. That's when Ned grabbed Goldsmith's book of poems from the floor. I must have inadvertently dropped it while struggling with him. We both leaped for it simultaneously, he winning the challenge. He held it above my head in triumph. See, mother, learning in words. Poems rot your daughter's mind. Let's see what garbage is in here. And then he read the lines. Let the rich deride the proud disdain, these simple blessings of the lowly train. The rich man's joys increase the poor's decay. Mary, this time it was Papa's voice. He and Henry had entered the parlor without my knowledge. Ned's taken my poetry, I inexplicably said to Father. He would never take my side. And I'm throwing it out. Ned tossed the book in the fire. I cried as I watched it burn, daring not to move, wondering how to flee. Papa grabbed me by the hair while Mama blamed me for injuring James and Henry howled. It all came out in a garbled mess. Mama and Ned reciting explanations and ranting about my poor behavior. Papa shouted above them, angry at the noise. Take her to her room, Papa said, flinging me at Ned. Ever your dutiful servant, Ned said, and then he dared to bow. Resolute in my defiance, I resisted his efforts to control my flailing arms. Admittedly, I was stunned by the loss of Goldsmith's work and felt I was battling the evil poem. The wealthy take everything from the poor, their house, land, and food, leaving a desolate, lonely shell. I was that shell being dragged up the stairs by my hair. Hold her arms, Ned ordered Henry, who had come up with us. I was somewhat aware of Henry beside me. They had me at the entrance to my room and shoved me onto a stool. That'll teach you, Ned said. Henry had integrated himself wholeheartedly into the disagreement and had taken my bedsheets and thrown them over me. I must have looked like a drunken ghost on my way to hell. For God's sake, Ned, I shouted as I tried to free myself from the linen. You know I didn't hurt James. You are obligated to me, Ned shouted. You are not equal to me. I have the inheritance. You have the pitiful dowry. It is in your special interest to always be humble to me. Do as I ask and make yourself useful, or I will personally throw you out. Be pleasant or God will punish you. God's punishment is my redemption, I said. I heard the door slammed and pulled off the sheet. Alone in my room, I cried about the loss of my book and made this declaration. I, 
Mary Wollstonecraft, of human mind and female body, declare that I want to be treated equally.